Hey guys, Josh here. Welcome to my YouTube channel. As always, the best thing you can do to support the interviews I do here is by hitting that subscribe button. It's up here somewhere. Of course, check out our sponsors. They're in the show notes. Uh, but in the meantime, my gift to you this week, a great chat. James Corden on the end of his late night run on the future of his acting career, his new show Mammals, and so much more. Hi guys, um, thank you all so much for coming out on this rainy uh, New York night. Uh, you're in for a treat. This is, uh, of course, our latest edition of Happy Sad Confused Live. Uh, I love doing these at 92NY with a homegrown audience as a, as a New Yorker. It pleases me to no end. And it really pleases me because this is a first time guest on the podcast, a gentleman I have such admiration for because uh, what, for the last eight years, I believe? He's been making it look easy night after night. He's coming to the end of a phenomenal run as the host of The Late Late Show. But in, in addition, you know he is a phenomenal actor of stage and screen, a Tony Award winner, uh, and the star of this amazing new show on Prime, Mammals, which you all should check out if you haven't already. Uh, we're in for a fun night with Mr. James Corden. Please give it up. Hi. Welcome, James. Um, I'm honored to be here. It's, 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 Truly, it's, I am. It's a thrill. Um, so let's, let's talk, first of all. So this show, yes. this uh, new endeavor, is, is striking and it's not striking to me because you, unlike your brethren in Late Night, you were an actor first. The, the, the late, we're going to get to the Late Night show, but like that was the anomaly. You are a born and bred actor, and you've made a point of trying, of not trying, but keeping acting as a primary occupation, even during this very weighty day job. Mm. Um, was that important to you over the last eight years to kind of figure out how to fit that in and make that still a, a Very, priority for you? Yes. I mean, look, if I'm being honest, which I intend to be tonight. Um, <laughs> uh, the lies are so much more I, entertaining. I, uh, <laughs> I probably, if I'm honest, and I think I knew this at the time, probably said yes to too many things that, that came my way. I essentially, I think, almost said yes to, to almost and everything because I, I, I love acting. I love it. And I love working with directors and I love being a member of a cast. I really like being in a cast, I think, more than I like hosting a show on my own. Right. And not that you ever do anything on your own in any of these things, but you know what I mean. And... The reason for doing that was I always knew, I knew from minute one that when I took this, this job to, to host this show, I always knew it was an adventure and not a final destination. I was so certain that that was the case. I knew it had to be. And, and so, yeah, I think you're right. Like, I did probably do a lot of things because I didn't want it to be a shock. I didn't want to finish hosting the show. And I'm aware that it still will be to, to, to some people, but I didn't want it to feel like, huh, you're doing what? <laughs> yeah, OK. And, um, you know, so as much as I could, I mean, look, I never thought... I never thought that when I started hosting the show that a part like this would come my way whilst I was doing it, written by a writer like Jez... Butterworth, who wrote the show, I didn't, I actually thought there's a strong chance something like this will never come my way after this. And I'd made my peace with that. And I thought, well, if I hope it will, I think it's going to take a few years of sitting in the silence and waiting to be somebody's interesting idea right. to, to, to come along. And, uh, and I, it kind of blew me away when it came along in the middle of it. Really? Yeah. Is that partially because, and I'm sure this audience knows, but Jez Butterworth, I mean, a fascinating resume as a accomplished playwright. We were talking backstage. I mean, there, this is a guy that I saw first, uh, Jerusalem on yeah. Broadway with Mark Rylance, and yet also, as you were saying, writes Bond movies, Indiana Jones, and can kind of do everything. It's an extraordinary career as a, as a writer. I think it's almost unmatched, really. Like, normally, the, the sort of road from Tony Award-winning playwright moving into film is, is, you know, sort of A24, Fox Searchlight, 
movie as, as what you'd call a smaller sort of awards fair sort of film. Um, whereas he has these plays which are extraordinary. They are, I mean, watching Jerusalem for me was a kind of life-changing experience actually, and I don't say that lightly. And then to write a play like Jerusalem, a play like Mojo or The Ferryman, and then also, yeah, right, like two Bond movies, the new Indiana Jones, Ford versus Ferrari, and countless punch-ups on Cruella or all these other movies. It is a sort of unmatched career, really. And that's why I think the show is interesting and feels unique, because it's very, very small. It's very small, French music. <laughs> and yet there are so many twists yes. and turns that it has something of a sort of whodunit thriller about it, and you can see him pulling on all of his, all of the things that he's done in his career. Yeah. How, how soon into reading the material did you know you were in, you were interested? I mean, is this one of those things where it is, I, for those that haven't seen the show, it's six episodes, and it, it keeps you on your toes, yes. to say the least. It is, a, it is a hard show to summarize. It's almost impossible. Yeah, I'm not gonna even try. No, it is. <laughs> Um, it's really hard to, to even sort of think or talk about, but like what I will say is episode, when I read episode one, um, I thought it's kind of my feeling reading episode one is I think the feeling that you have when you watch episode one, which is five minutes in, you're like, oh, okay, I know what this show is. Right. And five minutes later you go, oh no, it's not that, it's this. And then 10 minutes after that you go, oh, okay, I have no idea what this is. <laughs> I'm just and gonna I go don't on the know ride where and it's just, going, yeah, yeah, yeah. and, and yeah. then he just he just proceeds to constantly kind of pull the rug from under you yeah. at the end of every of every episode. Yeah, he's a. I, I mean, I think he is as good a writer as as any is who's working today. I really, really do. Yeah. Essentially, the start of the show is uh, Jamie, uh, my character, and his wife Armandine have gone on a, a baby moon. She's pregnant, and it's a sort of last hurrah, and they've gone to this gorgeous cabin in Cornwall. They are as in love as two people could ever be. Um, and the next thing that happens essentially is that they lose their baby and it's heartbreaking. And he goes to the hospital and tells her that he made a, he made a deal with, with God that when they took her away into the operating theatre, he got onto his knees and he prayed. And she says, but you don't believe in God. He goes, I know I don't. It's complete bollocks. But I did. I prayed and I told him that I can't live without her. She is everything to me and I love her so much. And that's where they're at as a couple. So just before that moment there, he's been on the phone calling. She said, take my phone. He said, I haven't got everyone's numbers. And, and call friends and family and let them know. So you see a jump cut of him uh, speaking to, to various friends and family members and... The weight of the grief of all of it is on his shoulders and at that moment his phone beeps and he looks down at his phone and he reads some very, very explicit texts from a man named Paul and realises that his wife has been having an affair. And at the moment that he realises that, Tom Jones walks up next to him on the beach. <laughs> and, and then that bit. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it is, look, the absurdity of life, where, yes, in a deeply, profoundly moving existential crisis, Tom Jones may appear. Like, this is life, in, in, in a way. And there's no reason why he shouldn't at that moment. Right, right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, you've said this character is closest to you than any other character you've played, and that I almost am worried, James, because this is a damaged, this is a sad man. This is a man dealing with a lot. Why do you say that? Because I think we're all damaged men dealing with so, a lot. Yeah. <laughs> like, I don't, I don't know anyone who isn't. Yeah. So, you know, like, you've got a podcast called Sad, Happy, Confused. I don't know what, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> I don't know, I don't know what yeah. else we can, you know. Yeah. So in that sense, I, uh, yeah, I feel, like I, I feel like I knew him from the off. I appreciated his passion for life. Um, and, I, and, and look, he, the, the just, I, I don't want this to sound like I'm just sort of in love with him, but I kind of <laughs> am in love with him. But he just kind of writes characters so well that you, he finds your voice. And, and I, I just, yeah, I know he is, he is kind of similar to me, yeah. in a sense, really. And I sort of, 
yeah, I'm aware that like, <laughs> you know, when I host a talk show, it's, it's sort of there. <laughs> but uh, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not really like that every day, no. you know? <laughs> I that would be so annoying. <laughs> No, I, I get it. To be like opening the fridge and being like, oh my God! <laughs> <laughs> Stick around! <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah, it would be annoying. Yeah. Yeah. Don't believe yeah. me. <laughs> <laughs> For the right context, it's perfect. Sure. But outside of it, no, yeah. no. Um, and it's great to see them in this amazing cast. This is not the first time you've worked with the great Sally Hawkins. That's a, that's a lovely kind of reunion. Yeah, Sally's a, a dear friend of mine. We first worked together in, in uh, 2001 on a, a, a Mike Lee film called All or Nothing, which um, is uh, as, as, as bleak a film as you could ever find. <laughs> um, there ain't many laughs in that one. <laughs> but it's, uh, no, I mean, and we worked together. Well, we didn't actually really actually in the film, in the finished movie, have um, really many scenes together at all, if at all, actually. But the way that Mike works, you, you rehearse and build your character for six months. Yeah. And... <laughs> I felt like anyone who saw Sally just in those rehearsal rooms was like, oh, wow. I mean, she's kind of extraordinary. Her, I don't know. She, what she has is an unquantifiable thing. that You just can't really put your finger on as to how she's doing it or how she's making it just so effortless. If you watch Shape of Water, I sort of can't believe what she's doing with so few lines. Yeah. You know, it's amazing. And what she does in this show, her character is arguably becomes the most interesting character in the in the show. Actually, is 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 as the as the show turns and it takes turns. But into episodes five and six, I defy you not to go. Okay, I don't even really know what this show is. But, <laughs> uh, it really takes some some twist and and she's amazing in it. And I I you know I I I love her. I love her dearly as a friend. And it, it, you know you can't help but learn when you're working with somebody like her. I, I mean, yes, not to oversell the show, but I always say this about whether it's TV or film, I need the big swings. I've seen enough doubles in TV and film over the years, and this is a big swing. And you are, you are there's nothing else like this on television, so. Thanks, man. I, 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 that's so nice of you to say. It is almost impossible to talk about yeah. in a sense of it's just hard to describe. <laughs> you're sort of on one level, you're like, it's just people talking about marriage and, you know, it's not making, somebody said the other day that it's making uh, some harsh statements about marriage. And I think Jez would disagree with that. He's a happily married man. Um, but he, he, said, he said at this press thing that we did, he said, look, I, he said, from what I can work out, marriage, marriage was created to carve up various pieces of land rights <laughs> and stem the desire of women. And we're still doing it. And at the very least, at the very least, can we all just admit that it might be silly? <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, I, I hope people find it. I'm very, very proud of it, as I say. Um, read the clip we saw of you vomiting in front of the great Tom Jones. Is that the first time you vomited in front of a celebrity? Do you, uh... I've, yes, I've never, I've never vomited. <laughs> I've never vomited in front of a celebrity ever. No, that's never happened to me. Have you come close? Do the nerves ever overtake you? I mean, the nature of your job is you're interacting with amazing talent, three or four amazing people a night. So that would not be a sustainable option, I suppose, but... but I don't really get nervous with actors, uh, sometimes with musicians, right? but not with actors. The, the people I get most nervous meeting are like West Ham United soccer players. <laughs> <laughs> but genuinely, I am so starstruck right. if I meet, like, Jared Bowen, <laughs> much more than, you know, if you had to drop out on, on, on Monday or Sunday and I would have to step in and interview Daniel Craig, right. I'd be fine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let, take me back, okay. Young James, any family, friends, would, would they, if I were talking to them, would any of them be surprised? Maybe the level of success might surprise them because that's, uh, that's just, lottery kind of a thing. Nobody achieves what you achieve. But the fact that you are an entertainer, would they have said, yes, we saw that? I don't done. think it's that they would have seen it. I think I was quite rambunctious in telling them <laughs> that that's what I was going to do. I just don't remember a time. I don't, I just, 
I honestly don't remember a time that I didn't want to perform in some capacity. I can't, not a day, not a day where it was like, oh, I think I'd like to be a soccer player or a fireman or, why is that so funny? Wow. <laughs> wow. <laughs> <laughs> um, I am terrible. Uh, no, I just, I just lived for it. I loved it. It was, and I, and I don't know if there'll be, if there's any performers in this room or young people who are interested in, in performing or acting, but, but I, I absolutely felt everything that you feel now, which is like, sometimes you feel like you, you don't understand. No one understands that this isn't something you have a choice in. There is something in me that is compelling me to do this, and I cannot, I cannot shake it. And, uh, and that's how I felt. That's how I felt the entirety of school. It, I, there, was, there was nothing that could stop me trying to do it in any capacity. And, I mean, the un unique thing about you is you have so many talents, so many interests, you can do so many things. There are different paths for you. There could have been different paths for you. You've taken different paths. I guess my question is, like, when you were 14 or 15, like, did you have a specific focus? Like, did you know what path to go on, or were you kind of equal opportunity, wherever the opportunity is, I'm gonna, I'm gonna grab it, or what was your mindset early on? Well, I think early on, probably, it, it was the, the theatre, yeah. because everything else just seemed so out of reach. Right. It just seems insane that you would even get to be on television, or let alone, like, make a film. But because I think, you know, I would, I would be in every school play, ever, I had drama, drama clubs outside of school, singing, dancing. I used to go to an after-school drama club called the Jackie Palmer Stage School, where it, it, you would go after school to these lessons, but they also had like an agency where I would go up and audition for like paint commercials or the sound of music at Sadler's Wells. <laughs> and I never got a single job. I never, ever, I didn't get a job from probably about 11 or 12 till I was 17 when I got my first job. And I would probably go up for these like open castings once a week, once a fortnight. But interestingly, what's amazing, and I don't know what was in the water in High Wycombe at this moment, but there was, in, there was a patch where it was me and uh, a couple of years below me was Eddie Redmayne and a couple of years below that was Aaron Taylor Johnson. And uh, it, it's, it's been incredible it's just amazing, like, seeing them, like, Eddie's won an Oscar, everyone's saying that Aaron might be Bond. Yeah. Um, and if he is, that'll be devastating to my sort of <laughs> legacy in High Wycombe. <laughs> As it stands right now, I'm the biggest deal in High Wycombe. If he... Because we even went to the same school. We went to Holmer Green Upper, decades apart, obviously. Um, and, um, yes, it's going to be a crushing blow. <laughs> Bond villain? A, uh... I don't know. I think I'm capable of a lot of things. A Bond villain? I can't see anybody <laughs> buying it. <laughs> I just feel like you've got to know your limits. Right. And I just can't... <laughs> the idea of me swiveling around holding a pussycat... <laughs> People will be like, oh, this, is, this has gone too far now. <laughs> what next? Martin Short's going <laughs> to zip line in? <laughs> Did ever, the interesting thing about that, you mentioned some of your contemporaries, is like everybody moves at their different pace, right? The yeah. success happens at different mm. levels. Yes. Um, like, where was, like, were you behind, ahead? Were you frustrated? Where, who experienced fame first? Like, what was your trajectory versus some of your friends and contemporaries? Um, I don't know, really. Uh, in, in answer to, 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 do you mean to those two specifically? Well, it or could just... be those two, or how you just generally felt in those well, early years? Did you feel like you were behind or ahead of the curve or what? I think the biggest moment in terms of... It's almost impossible if you're an actor to... And you know you shouldn't, but you can't not compare yourself to other people that are around you. And that is a, a pointless exercise. Right. But it's impossible not to. And I th if I could think about the time I've wasted, that I've wasted in my life, 
wasted time of sitting thinking about where, well, this person's doing that and I'm doing this and they're not there. And you're so busy looking left and right and judging where other people might be that you never, ever, ever look and see what you've got in front of you and realize, oh my God, what have I ever got to complain about, you know? Um, I think the time I probably felt it the most was in the History Boys, right. where we were eight boys of a similar age, more or less at a similar place in our careers. And that play, that play just went off like a rocket. Yep. Like, sometimes you're in stuff that people think is good and nobody sees it. Sometimes you're in stuff that people think is shit and everybody sees it or, and vice versa. Every now and then, every now and then you're in something, if you're lucky enough, you're in something that everybody says is good and loads of people are seeing it and it's amazing. It's like a magic thing you can't... And that play, that play was a, a, a moment for every boy in that play. Right. Every teacher in that play, everyone. And when that play took off, Dominic Cooper, who's like one of my best friends, we used to live together. He introduced me to my wife. He's still one of my best friends. Like, well, he would, and all the boys actually at points, they would come in with like, sometimes like six scripts and be like, oh, I can't go out tonight because I'm meeting Martin Scorsese tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> and then I remember there was one day, we, when we were doing the play at the National, there was one day and myself, uh, Russell Tovey and Andrew Knott had all been told about this film. There was a new film being made. And like every film that's a, almost about to be made, it's amazing. <laughs> and um, it was about two backpackers and they get, I think, falsely accused of a murder. Sure. And they were looking for two young boys or something. We were like, oh my God, this is amazing. And we were all getting sent the script to the stage door. So we go down to get the scripts and Russell had the whole script and Andy had the whole script and I had three pages for a guy who runs a newsstand. And I was like, oh man. And it felt like this is only because of how I look. Right. I don't look like somebody who should be uh, anybody ever. And I was like, oh man. Okay, and it became clear to me that, that, that it felt like, in a way, people were saying, well, no, no, we think you're good, and we can't wait to see you play some sort of bubbly judge when you're 55. Right. You know? Right. Uh, or, like, you can drop off a TV to Hugh Grant in a movie. <laughs> <laughs> no one would do it better. You would and, kill. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. and then I was like, oh, okay. So then I just thought, well, if no one's going to kind of just pull up a seat and say, here's a place to sit down at whatever metaphorical table I've <laughs> created in my mind, which is my own bullshit that doesn't exist, and everybody thinks they've got their own struggles and no one thinks they've ever been invited in the door. But at that moment, it did feel like that. I thought, okay, well, I need to write something. Yep. So myself, me and my friend, Ruth Jones, yeah. who, yeah, yeah, good for you, madam. <laughs> she, let me tell you, that lady's response is the absolute right response. <laughs> so hearing the words Ruth Jones, she is the best person on earth and one of my best friends and godmother to my son. And we were both on this show at the time and um, we decided to write a TV show together. I think we were both feeling perhaps the slight frustrations and we decided let's write this show together. And... Um, we wrote a show called Gavin and Stacey. We cast ourselves as the friends. And, uh, I, you know, who could have ever predicted that that show would do what it did in the, in, in the UK? Like, our first episode aired with, I think it was 430,000 viewers on BBC Three. And when we put the last episode out, uh, it was the most watched scripted show of the decade in Great Britain. Yeah. And it kind of changed everybody's lives who were in it and no more so than Ruth and I. And uh, yeah, it, it was that really. That, but, the, but writing that show came out of a feeling that was very, very bad. Yes. And that's, I think, the most important thing to realise is sometimes things happen in your life and you might think that they're very, very good. 
And two years down the line, you go, oh, that was the worst thing that could have ever happened to me. Certainly when you think about love or relationships um, and vice versa, you can have moments where at the time you think, oh, you know, career wise, whatever it is, you think, oh, I can't believe this is happening and you're down. And then two years later you go, oh my God, I learned so much from that. That was the best thing that could have ever happened to me yeah. at that time. If it hadn't have been for that, it would have been for this, which comes down to the notion that you cannot compare yourself to anybody else. You are in your own lane and your own race and you're in a race with nobody um, and you're here for like a second to so stop looking at other people and think about what you can do I guess yeah, is the as thing. much as you can yeah. chart your own path and let others define your your career and life yeah. for you yeah no it's, it's a it's a great lesson and a great a great end product uh, before we revel in some of the other successes like one man two governors and the late late show I do want to bring up one sad audition mm. is it true that one of your first auditions was for Lord of the Rings yeah. How'd that go, James? Not good. <laughs> Everyone, every single person in London auditioned for Lord of the Rings. <laughs> Everybody. And I auditioned for uh, Samwise. Sure. And, and uh, I put myself on tape. You had to go, this is before we, everyone had really their own camera or anything, so you'd go to this casting place, put yourself on tape. And I was sort of, I was doing it, Josh. I was doing the accent and everything, <laughs> Mr. Frodo! <laughs> and, um, and I was with uh, two of my other friends went in. And, uh, and then, I, we, then, we went, then we all got called back the next day. And then we got called back the next day. And then um, none of us got called back <laughs> after that. <laughs> yeah. You able to watch the films to this day? Is there PTSD? Is no, there, I, is there I think... Uh, <laughs> I, I, no, I, I very much enjoy those uh, movies. I enjoyed it until the last one, and then I sort of, I was like, okay, I think I've seen this now. Yeah. So I, <laughs> yeah, well. And then I thought, oh, I should have gone to see Love Actually. It's a lot of middle words. Yeah, so exactly. <laughs> exactly. Are you looking to eat healthier and save money on takeout this year, but still want to enjoy delicious food? Of course you do. We at Happy Second Fused have the solution for you. It's called Wild Grain. Wild Grain is the first ever Bake From Frozen subscription box for sourdough breads, fresh pastas, and artisanal pastries. Guys, when I got my box from Wild Grain, I was over the moon. There was pasta in there, there were croissants, there were chocolate croissants, and it's all delicious and easy to make. And unlike typical supermarket bread, wild grain uses a slow fermentation process that's easier on your belly, lower in sugar, and rich in nutrients and antioxidants. Plus, every item bakes from frozen in 25 minutes or less. And we've got good news for you guys. All you have to do is sign up at wildgrain.com slash happy sad and choose which type of box you want to receive and how often. It's super easy to reschedule, skip, or cancel. Don't worry, they make it easy on you guys, trust me. Plus, for a limited time, you can get $30 off the first box, plus free croissants in every box. Are you listening to me? Free croissants, folks. When you go to wildgrain.com slash happy said, that's where you can start your subscription. And you heard me right. Let me say it one more time. Free croissants in every box and $30 off your first box when you go to wildgrain.com slash happy sad. That's wildgrain.com slash happy sad. Or you can use the promo code happy sad at checkout. You talked history boys and then um, you have this other kind of phenomenal experience on stage that we should mention. Um, One man, two governors, which mm. really changed things. Um, what a, a beautiful time in your life that really it was oh. another kind of moment like History Boys in a different way that was a, a it was a true phenomenon. Yeah, I mean, it was, it was, uh, I mean, look, I, I knew when I was doing it that I don't know if I'll ever play a better part than this, than this part. It was so beautifully created by, well, originally it's based on a, on a Carlo Goldoni for farce called A Servant to Two Masters and Richard Bean ad adapted it, um, and I'll, I remember when we did a reading just of Act One, he'd just written Act One and we sat around a table and Jemima was there, who was actually in the start of that scene, and, and Ollie Chris, who played Mrs. Dubberson. And, and there was just various actors who were in shows at the National and, and we read it. And I, I, I couldn't, I just couldn't call it. Well, I was like, I don't, I just remember saying to Nick, like, I, I don't, this is either just a disaster or it's really funny. And I was waiting for him to go, no, 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 trust me, I know what I'm doing. 
And he went, yeah, you're absolutely right. And I thought, no, you, you can't think that. But uh, no, I mean, I will say, we did the show, like, I think 470 something times. And by the time we got to New York, I, 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 it, there were nights doing that show on Broadway where I genuinely, there's, there's a big scene at the end of Act One, a big dinner scene where he essentially serves food to two different, uh, to his two bosses. There were moments doing that scene in New York where I can remember I'd go home to my wife and I would say, if I could, if I could stay in that moment, if I could stay in that minute tonight, I would live there forever. It's just such a well-written play. Yeah. He's just, the constructs of it are so good that it almost refuses to let the audience not root for you in some, in some capacity, which then just means you can just, it's almost like a poker game and fun is the currency. And, and I would have to come out and look at the audience and say, I'm gonna have fun tonight. And they'd go, well, you think you're having fun. We'll raise you some fun. Yeah. And I go, well, I'm going to raise you some more fun. <laughs> and by the end of Act One, you just think, okay, now we have to do Act Two really quickly because it absolutely is not as good as Act One. You know. <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, look, the, the career is obviously going amazingly. The acting roles are are diverse and fascinating. It's musicals. It's Into the Woods. It's a wonderful film, Begin Again, that people should check out. Um, and this was not on the docket to host the late night show. This was never on the docket for you. When this came around, again, you have a really exciting acting career going. How long were the lists of pros and cons? How much did you debate this big decision to change your life for the late late show? Well, what I've realized in both agreeing to, take, to do the show and then making the decision to leave the show is that writing lists of pros and cons is futile because um, sometimes the pros or the cons can be so monumental, it's pointless putting them on a list <laughs> because you go, well, no, there's only three things here and there's 10 things here, but two of these three are <laughs> huge and outweigh the difficulties in moving, right, you know? I it. <laughs> um, I, in truth, I was very reticent to, to do it at first. Yeah. It came about so oddly where I had come to, I'd gone to Los Angeles, to, I had an idea for a TV show, a, a new idea for a show, and I kind of came to LA and I, I pitched it around at maybe five or six different places. And some people were very interested in making the show and CBS actually made the most aggressive financial offer. But as I had sat with the show and lived with it, I realized that this, this show was never, ever going to get aired on CBS, ever. And um, very fortunately, HBO had made an offer, so I decided to make it with HBO. And then I got told that CBS were very angry because they couldn't work out why anybody would take like a quarter of the money to make something over here, and they'd made a big offer and all this stuff. So I actually happened to be in New York, and I, sort of, I pointed it out to my children yesterday. I said, that's the building, it's got Black Rock. That's the building I went in, and, it, and all of our lives changed. Um, so I went to basically explain to them, and I sat with my then bosses, and I said, look, or the people that have become my bosses. And I said, look, I've done you a great favor here. I said, here's how this would play out. You would give me this money to make a show. I would deliver you a show that you would never put on your network. You would be angry and want me to change it. I would hate you for wanting me to change it. You would hate me for hating you for wanting me to change it. <laughs> we make a pilot, it never airs. You hate me, I hate you, and that's it. I said, that's how this plays out. I said, I have done you, I've saved you <laughs> quite a lot of money here. Anyway, they understood, we got on well, and Stephen Colbert had just been announced as taking over from David Letterman. And I told them that I thought it was really impressive, the way that they had dealt with that announcement. There was no kind of drip-fed rumors. It was clean, it was precise, it was brilliant. And we got talking about late night, and I said, what are you gonna do with that 12.30 slot? And, and, and I said, because that slot, I think, is an anomaly. And they were like, why? And I said, well, because there's nowhere else in television Nowhere else in television, I remember saying this, where you would go um, eight till nine, we're gonna have a hospital drama. And then nine till 10, we're gonna have another hospital drama with the same diseases. <laughs> <laughs> and I said- Maybe a different city, but same but disease. But the <laughs> disease is the same. 
And I said, I know, I know that, I remember saying, I know that you're a network television channel, uh, but, and I know that it's important for you to uh, ignore the fact that the internet exists <laughs> and to tell your advertisers that they, it doesn't exist. Although I said, but it does. And I said, and the people that watch late night is traditionally insomniacs, stoners, <laughs> students, or an amalgamation of the three. <laughs> and I said, uh, they're still watching content. Arguably, they might be consuming content more than ever before. They're just consuming it in a different way. And I said, that 12.30 slot, you should hold your hands up and hand it over to the internet. You should make a show that can embrace the internet. Anyway, we're just chatting. I leave, this has been great. I'm gonna do the thing with HBO. I was thinking about doing a musical potentially on Broadway. I was maybe gonna do a funny thing happen on the way to the forum. We weren't, we hadn't agreed to do it, but I was thinking very carefully about it. And I felt like, okay, I know what the next six, eight months is, and that's amazing if you're an actor. Um, and then they offered me this job, and I said, I said, no, that's very kind, I don't think I want to do that, and it just went back and forth and back and forth, and then I'd written a show called The Wrong Man's with my friend Matthew, and we were filming in Johannesburg, and I was FaceTiming my son on, or Skyping, it was Skype then. <laughs> do you remember Skype? <laughs> How did they fuck up the pandemic? <laughs> How did that happen? They had a 20-year lead <laughs> on everybody for the pandemic. And, but then, and, then, and then the pandemic hit, and people were like, should we Skype? And they went, yeah, let's Skype. Send me the Zoom ID. And that was it. It was like, <laughs> I've never seen anything like it. Had anyway. You, had you ever heard of Zoom before the pandemic? No, me neither. It was Skype only. <laughs> and all the boop, boop, boop. <laughs> boop, boop, boop. Boop, boop, boop. Yeah. Anyway, so... I was Skyping my son on my <laughs> birthday and my wife was pregnant and I was like, hang on a minute. Oh, do I really want... Uh, this is... All I actually want is to be creative every day. And it had come back around to me that it said, look, if you say no now, then they will take the no. But they've <laughs> come back and this is what they'd like to do. And I was like, am I being stupid here? Wouldn't I rather regret doing something than not doing something? Maybe there's a world in which I could do something that satisfies all my needs and we'll be together as a family, and, which is hugely important to me. And maybe that's what we should do. And, and then I thought, OK, we've got to jump now. We, could, we should jump and have a go at this safe in the knowledge that it absolutely won't work. I will get fired. <laughs> but hang on, I, it really occurred to me that, that I didn't need to host a late night show. I could just have an hour of TV every night. And it wasn't the notion of being like, oh, hang on, I need to come up with 13 great desk bits. It was like, I can come up with any bit we want. Yeah. Uh, and if we get it right, those things might get shared online and people will watch them, and we're not making a show. The first thing I said when we sort of met as a team and we did the show, it was the only thing I really said, was we're not making a show that airs at 12.35 at night on CBS. We're making a show that launches at 12.35 on CBS, and if we make this show right, people will consume it all day and all night on their phones, their iPads, their computers and everything. And, uh, I, and I was saying all of this with absolutely no knowledge of how to do <laughs> such a thing. <laughs> I, I, I didn't, if anyone had said, okay, but how, I'd have gone, I don't know. <laughs> I will not take any yeah. follow-up questions no, at this correct. time. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. it does, I mean, in retrospect, it did and does utilize all your talents. It is an amazing, even if you were and are an actor at your heart, you acted with everybody over the last eight years. You acted with the most amazing talent in the most brilliant, irreverent sketches mm. on your own terms. Well, it's all a performance. Like, it's not me. Well, I mean, it's close to me. Sure. And I'm aware that it looks like me. <laughs> but it's not really... It, it, you know, and so as soon as I clicked that into my head, I was like, oh, this is all a performance. Right. But then, actually, maybe our job is just to really, really have a blast, you know? And, and, it, and it has been. It's been, it's been... It's been the single greatest time of my life. Without question. As someone 
somewhat in the space, and I've spent many years trying to convince celebrities to do crazy things. I have such admiration and and uh, for what you've been able to accomplish, and it's and and not to mention as a late night fan my entire life to find new ways to skin that cat. That is that is a tough thing. That is <laughs> it is tough to bring new stuff to the table in late night after the the history we've seen. Um, yeah, you know. but I think it helps that I didn't grow up here. Right. I really do. You needed an outsider I, I really, to shake really, it up. Honestly, yeah. Like, yeah. I really do. The idea that we have all the guests out on the couch at the same time, the idea that we wanted to make it feel like it was somewhere you would go after a night at the theatre. Right. Like, we would think a lot about the show and, well, we're following Stephen's show. Well, where does Stephen do? Where's Stephen going to do his show? Well, we followed David Letterman for about 25 shows. Then we followed Hawaii Five O for about a summer. <laughs> and then we started following Stephen. And we thought, well, Stephen's going to do it from a Broadway theatre in a big room, and we also felt like, well, knowing Stephen as we did, that he would be doing a show that would lean quite heavily into politics. We were like, well, where would you go after a night at the theatre? You might go to a bar, you might go to a comedy club, you might go to a jazz club. OK, well, let's try and bring the ceiling down of our studio. Let's try and make it lower. Let's bring the audience closer. I think we're the only late night show where it's sort of the desk, three rows of audience, and the cameras go then be behind that, and then there's more audience the other Smart. side of that, yep. which is just trying, and, and the, the, the seats at the front all have small tables and lamps. We were like, let's try and bring it in. Let's try and make it a place that you might go at 12.30. Let's try and make it a conversation that can spring around between how amazing if we've got Zac Efron, Bill Hader, and Ben Kingsley, OK, well, what will that conversation feel like? Right, and right. where will it go? And let's try and keep it organic and alive. And we would think about every fabric of the show, but we would only think about the audience. How will it feel after that? How will it feel in that moment? How are they feeling when they're watching it? And, uh, and that's all we'd ever really do. All right, guys, let's talk about security, specifically VPNs. Our sponsor this week is NordVPN. By now, I hope you guys know what a VPN is. It's, of course, a virtual private network. It's a service that protects your internet connection and privacy online. It creates an encrypted tunnel for your data, protects your online identity by hiding your IP address and allows you to use public Wi-Fi hotspots safely. So NordVPN is the one to use because it's so easy to use. You connect with one click or even enable auto connect for zero click protection. Plus, they've got over 5,200 servers in 59 countries. It's got amazing speeds. It's actually been confirmed by speed test. NordVPN is the fastest VPN out there. You can use six devices on it on every major platform. I like it also because you can get movies, streaming, other content anywhere everywhere. Don't miss your favorite content from home when traveling abroad. It just takes a click. You open the map, you click on a location, and you'll be connected in seconds. It's that easy. You can find services at a lower price, a platform maybe that isn't available in your home country. Simply change your virtual connection. The good news for you guys is we've got an exclusive NordVPN deal by going to nordvpn.com slash happy sad to get a huge discount off your NordVPN plan plus four additional months for free. That's four additional months for free guys it's completely risk-free with nord's 30-day money back guarantee the link of course is in the episode description but go over to nordvpn.com slash happy sad and remember to get your discount now who didn't you get to do something you wanted well you you literally got tom cruise to jump oh, out so of long. a plane yeah with you how many yeah. pitches were there to Daniel Day Lewis to go shoe cobbling with you. How many? Like, yeah, okay. we've never pitched. I don't think our pitch has ever made Daniel Day Lewis's uh, <laughs> desk. So he better make a decision quick. <laughs> um, it's now or never, Danny. No, look, it's look. Doing a show like this is always uh, an up at dawn, pride swallowing <laughs> siege to steal a line from Jerry Maguire. It is. You you're always just trying and hoping that, that, that people will get the thing that you've pitched them, that they'll have the time or the inclination to do it. And then you can't take it personally if they don't, because you've just got to go, well, there's another show tomorrow. Right. You know, that's it, really. There's another show tomorrow. So you can't really dwell on anything. It's not really about thing. You've got to celebrate your, your victories, let your failures go. None of these things last forever. Yep. Like, Failure isn't finite and success isn't everlasting. Most of the time, you're 
just wallowing somewhere in between and you just got to go, okay, well, we got to, the show, you know, it's that thing, it's a sort of classic line, I think it was written in, in a book about Saturday Night Live, which is, you know, the show doesn't start because it's ready. Right. The show starts because it's, it's four o'clock right. and it's on in New York in five hours time. It's on in Canada <laughs> in two, and a, two hours time. So we better get a move on, you know? The show also came during a run where, like, I know your intention throughout from the beginning was to make an escape, an entertainment, a piece of something that people could enjoy and just go in with an open heart. And you've done it through this tumultuous time in history, this yeah. tumultuous divided political time. Was mm. it tough for you to navigate that, to figure out like how much to comment, how much to address, how much to be in that conversation every day or, or at all? It, it is hard. It's hard because it's hard because I'm from High Wycombe. It's a small market town, like 40 minutes outside London. I didn't go to university. I don't think, I think I, I look, I have opinions about everything, but I don't necessarily feel like, I feel like if people are looking to me, then we're really in trouble. <laughs> Like, like, and no one, no one really tells you, no one pulled me aside ever and went, um, and look, I can speak about things sure. that I'm passionate about. I can say, I, there are, uh, there's things I know and there's things I don't know. And, uh, the, you know, and, and there's lots of people saying those things. Right. So, but there is, the, there is a weird thing where somehow, and I don't know how this has happened, where somehow, Silence is seen as being complicit right. in the like you know this notion when sort of where well, you use your voice to be and you go okay but who are you talking to right who are you who am I talking to and do I have who anything is, to actually contribute to the well, conversation and you might do yeah. but you might end up just sort of shouting into some sort of congratulatory right. sort of echo chamber. Um, which I think happens, that's not in America, but that's, that's everywhere in the world that happens. That's, we're all doing that on the internet, yes. you know? So I feel like I would really like to just try and bring as much joy and light and levity to a situation as, or just to the show, really. Yeah. That's what I think our job is. But that has been, that has been a, a challenge over time, a lot of the time, because some of those things are really, really hard to joke about. So I didn't mind, I really, really felt like we would talk about Trump a lot, right? Because I didn't really see that as being like, I didn't even think that was politics. I just thought that that was just like right and wrong a lot of the time. Yeah. And, but what we'd always try and do with our show is go, okay, well, we can talk about it. But is there another way that we can incorporate what our show is, the fundamentals and foundations of our show, and is there a way where we know what we're going to say and we can present it in a different way? So, like, a great example of that is, like, when, when Trump came back to the White House after he'd had COVID and, you know, he drove around in that car and he took his mask off on the balcony and he said, and he gave that address and he said, you know, maybe I'm immune, I don't know. As an amazing writer who, who doesn't work on our show anymore, um, uh, he, he got off an incredible scripted job, and uh, my God, I love him, and I think he's going to do great things. His name is Lawrence Dye, and he literally just wrote us an email that night going, why don't we do a version of um, Maybe I'm Amazed uh, to Maybe I'm Immune? <laughs> and, uh, and then you're like... Okay, and then that's, that's when the show is the most fun. And that's the thing that I'll really miss, is like having an idea, and then it's like, okay, how do we do it? We need a piano, we need some screen, all this stuff, we need lyrics. You know, the, night, the day after the Oscars, it was clear what every, every late night show was going to be talking about. Yeah. Again, an upsetting and difficult thing to talk about. So you're like, well, we're gonna talk about it, but have we, is there anything we can do in the wheelhouse of our show that isn't that? And again, a great writer on our show, Molly Mitchell, she is brilliant. Just went, I think I might have had an idea. And you go, go on. And she was like, well, why don't we do, um, we don't talk about Jada. Um, 
and rewrite the lyrics of We Don't Talk About Bruno, which was the biggest song from Encanto that year. And you're like, OK. And then you're like, right, we need a steady cam. But then you're also like, well, hang on. We need people that have been tested because they're not going to get results. Oh, my God, there's a steady cam operator who's over on Dancing with the Stars. He can come for 20 minutes. OK, dancers, lyrics, the whole thing. Let's do it in one shot. And, and, and those, are the, those are the days when our show is most alive. Like, that idea happened at midday. Yeah. We shot it post-show at 6 p.m. We finished it at 7. It was on television two hours later. Uh, and I think we fed it down the line live because we had to put graphics on it as well. And so those are the moments where our show, I think, is able to navigate those moments and still hang on to the core sort of foundations of what our show is, or was always what we always wanted it to feel like. Um, let's, let's end with this. You are in the, you're in the home stretch of the show, and this mm. amazing run. How are you feeling about the future? Is there as much excitement as there is a touch of fear? I mean, the next phase is going to be wholly different, clearly. You've already gone through arguably three or four different very distinct phases in your career. How much can you control that? Do you feel in control of what's to come? I, I, feel, I feel excited and scared in equal measure, which I think is probably a good place to be. Yeah. I, I think, I think I've, I, I will, I, I, I will miss the show. I will miss the show more than, more than I think I can even comprehend right now. I will miss the people that I work with and the friendships that I've made. It is the most extraordinary place to work. But I just couldn't shake this feeling in myself that, that I've got to go and see if there's just another thing that I'm capable of. Safe in the knowledge and okay with the fact that that might never materialize, that this absolutely might be it. it and, and I have to make my peace with the notion that like, that's it. And I'll be some sort of question on Jeopardy, <laughs> you know? In, 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 like, in like 15 years' time, and I'm okay with that. I, honestly, I am. I am. I, I, I am. I feel like there was, an, there was a feeling of safety at the show, which is an unnatural feeling for me. And I, I watched... There's an amazing clip, which you should look up, uh, where David Bowie is talking about... Um, he says, uh, he's, he essentially talks about never, don't ever play for, to the gallery. Mm. Don't, ever, don't ever try and fulfill anybody else's expectations. That that's really dangerous. And he says, uh, he says in this clip, if you feel too safe in the environment that you're working in, it's probably about time to swim out into the water a little bit further. I think he says, so the, so the water's at your neck and your, your toes are scraping the floor and you feel like you just might be about to drown and if you find yourself there you're probably in you're probably in the right place to do something exciting i have no idea what's going to happen i have absolutely no plans <laughs> i'm i'm i think i probably should sit in some silence for a minute i think i should try not to jump into something else for at least a moment and I think what I've really got to do is remember the reason that we're going to move back to London is like, you know, my, my, my wife and children, we have, as a family, we have walked to the beat of my drum for a very long time now. It has been London, New York, Los Angeles. I'm shooting this in Germany. <laughs> Let's go, you know. And I, uh, I think I probably, I think I, I think I owe it to these three small people that I love, and I owe it to my wife to, to just go, I'm going to be here for a minute, and then we'll see what else is out there. And I'm, I haven't felt this way since I took the show. 
and that turned into something which even my wildest dreams couldn't couldn't perceive so or conceive rather so i'm i'm very excited to see what's next and that's it well It's uh, safe to say whatever comes next, next, uh, next rather, we're going to be watching um, in whatever form. Take your well-deserved break. Um, and look, truly, the, the mark you've left on late night is a really singular one. Congratulations on a great run. Congratulations on Mammals. Please spread the good word of this wonderful show on Prime. Um, and you've been so kind to me over the years, and I really appreciate you know it. We offered, you. you know we offered jo Josh a job <laughs> on the Late Late Show. We offered him a job on The Late Late Show eight years ago. Uh, Rob Crabb, who's the exec producer of our show, was like, he said to, I remember him saying to me, there's this guy in New York, and I think if we can get him, I think he's, I think he's a genius. <laughs> and, uh, and he was right, and I, I think oh, you chose the right thing not to do it, because I think what you're doing here is absolutely brilliant. I think you are so great at this. Thank you. And it's an honor for me to be on the show. It was only, it was only because it was only because I can't drive. I don't have a driver's <laughs> license. That was the only reason. Yeah, there was pre uh, <laughs> Yeah, Exactly. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. James Corden, give Thank it up you. one more time. Thank, Thank you. 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 Thank you.